Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and today on our show, we will discuss what it means for a Christian to deliberately turn away from salvation, to reject the gift of the Holy Spirit, and to commit the sin of apostasy, that is, rejecting God, turning away from God. Now, we're starting this show on page 148 of my book, Saved, a Bible Study Guide for Catholics. Saved, a Bible Study Guide, guide for Catholics. You can get that at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com and you'll find that the book is item T1784, 1784. Um, you can continue following along with us. If you have any questions, of course, uh, let us know. You can go online, you can email our Facebook or YouTube pages, and we'll try to respond to those, okay? All right, last week we were talking about this question, uh, and we ended up with this, with St. Paul, who is the great proclaimer of the necessity of faith, and of course, our Savior Jesus did too, but St. Paul was proclaiming the necessity of faith in order to be justified. And this, and Catholics like Protestants are, are in full agreement that that kind of faith is necessary, absolutely. However, we also saw that he did not hold to the idea that he was sure that he was saved. As we saw in 1 Corinthians, that he, he said, I don't have anything on my conscience, but that doesn't mean that I'm thereby justified. It is God who judges me, not other people, and I can't even do it myself. So that's where we were last week. Now we're going to go to another level of dealing with the scriptural problem in the doctrine of once you're saved, you're always saved. Remember, that is a doctrine that comes from especially the Calvinist doctrine uh, known as TULIP, that you know, they believe in total depravity as their starting point, and that God gives unconditional uh, predestination and limited atonement. Only some people get the atonement, some people do not. And that that grace is irresistible. You cannot say no to God's grace if you get it. And that's why, and, and especially that irresistibility the, in that you cannot resist the grace. That is absolutely key to this doctrine of once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't undo it because God gave it to you and he won't take it back. But your free will does not have anything to do with it. That's key in this, okay? Now, where do we find that that gets challenged, that idea of the uh, once saved, always saved. Where is that challenged the most? And it's in the letter to the Hebrews. In fact, I think that this may have been one of the reasons, because Hebrews contradicts this, that Martin Luther removed Hebrews from the Bible for a few years, his Bible. Um, in the 1520s, the mid-1520s, he uh, removed it along with six other books from the New Testament. He obviously wouldn't like James, and he, wouldn't li and, and he uh, didn't like uh, Second Peter. He didn't think that was Scripture. Second John, Third John. Uh, Jude or Revelation. And we'll see that 
not only Hebrews, but also 2 Peter contradicts this idea of once saved, always saved. And that may have been an instinct within him. He hadn't worked out this tulip notion the way Calvin did and Calvinists um, as fully, but he may have had an instinct that mm, this isn't consistent with what I teach. And so um, he, he took him out for a while. He put him back in later on, but that was his temptation for a few years. So where do we see this? In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6 is the first place. Let's go through that passage where it says, For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away since on their own they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. Now, this is something we have to pay attention to. Notice how it says that after they've become partakers of the Holy Spirit, they've tasted the goodness of the Word of God in the age to come, and then they go ahead and turn away. They commit, and, and the word that's used in Greek is to commit apostasy. Okay, that's um, to, to turn away. Now, this is something that is very, very serious. And there are people who have done it. I, I don't know if a lot of you realize this, but a number of the leaders of the Soviet Union had been to the seminary. Joseph Stalin was in the seminary for the Georgian Orthodox Church. Nikita Khrushchev, who later on became premier after Stalin, had also been to the seminary. He had memorized all four Gospels when he was a young man. And he left that apostle. Even Marx's family, Karl Marx, had been born into a Jewish family. They became Lutheran, though it's, I mean, different people say different things. I don't know all their motives. Some say it was because they wanted to avoid anti-Semitism and such. Um, but certainly uh, Marx had been a Lutheran for a short while in his life and then completely rejected not only Christianity, but the existence of God, and then came up with this famous line that religion is the opiate of the people. Um, and this has been part of the socialist governments of the 20th century have been all staunchly anti-Christian and anti-God. The Nazis, the National Socialist Workers' Party is what Nazi stands for, uh, and the um, uh, communists all, all rejected uh, you know, religion very strongly. And, and by the way, Hitler himself had been uh, raised as a Catholic. I don't know how committed he was. He <clears throat> apparently had given up the faith when he was a young man before World War I. You know, so he was very young when he gave up the faith. Uh, but he, he was something who was raised Catholic, by the way. Um, now, this recognition of people who have partaken in the Holy Spirit and the goodness of God, the powers of the grace and the age to come, these people are who, when they leave the faith, are understood by the letter to the Hebrews as having crucified Jesus Christ again. That's when there is this killing of Christ. There's something about it, and you know, this has happened at various times in the, the church. 
there have been any number of people who got into the seminary, became ordained, sometimes moved up high, but lost their faith. And as they lose their faith, they want to stay in the church because of power or money and sometimes other sins you know that they commit to use the church for their own gain instead of to promote the gospel and this would be them crucifying Christ again in fact um, Pope Francis has talked about such people as being something like Judas Iscariot who had known Christ had followed him and then turned on him and not only turned on him but betrayed him for money using a kiss that would be an example of people inside the church inside the church structure committing this apostasy and of course this contradicts the Calvinist idea of tulip that um, you cannot resist grace well Apparently, Hebrews understands that you have enough free will to resist it. Now, that's not the only passage that denies um, irresistible grace and perseverance without the possibility of falling away. That's what the P in TULIP means, perseverance, that you cannot fall away, which flows from the irresistible grace. If you take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 26, it says, For if we willfully persist in sin after having received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Now, talk about this, that after you have received this knowledge of the truth, you already have it in you, and then you turn away. It's another example of scripture teaching that you can have this knowledge of the truth, but you can still turn away. And this is something that uh, is uh, very much a threatening kind of sin. And in some ways, going back to Judas, Judas lives that out. That I have little doubt that if he had enough faith in Jesus, he could have gone to him and like St. Peter, he may well have been able to be forgiven. He may have been able to be forgiven had he come to Christ. I don't think, I can't imagine that Jesus would turn him away, but he didn't have enough faith after this sin of betraying because he realized this is wrong. He's innocent. He tried to give the money back. He tried to get them to undo it. And by the way, if you read the Mishnah, in Jewish law, when a witness contradicts what was said, he should have been listened to, but that wasn't what it was about. They decided they needed to kill him, and so that went on. And even when Judas threw the money into the temple and ran away, he didn't go to Jesus. He tried to solve the problem himself. And the way he solved the problem was to kill himself, which certainly broke the fifth commandment. You can't kill yourself. You don't have the right. You did not give yourself your own life, and you don't have the authority to take your own life away. God gave you life, and he can take it. It's his. But for you to take your own life is to do something that contradicts God's authority. 
And this is something that you may not do. But this passage shows that there, it's possible to commit a deliberate sin at the knowing the full truth of Christ. And that contradicts the idea of be, once you're saved, you're always saved. And that the reason the sin is deliberate in these folks is that they still have free will. See, that's key here. The total depravity part of TULIP, the T in TULIP, that is not true enough. Yes, we are fallen, but you overstate the case. People still have free will, and God's grace is not irresistible to a free person. God shows respect to the person and will give his grace uh, to those who accept it, but for those who reject it, it's gone. And it's not God taking it back, it's humans rejecting it. And the capacity to turn away from God's grace and be judged uh, with damnation is possible. That's why, again, you're not saved always once you're saved. It is something quite different. Another passage that deals with this is in 2 Peter. Again, one of the uh, seven books that, uh, again, Luther took out of the New Testament for a short while. This is in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 to 21, where it says, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now again, these are people who have escaped the defilements of the world. The world does defile us. They set before us all kinds of possible sins. People who are caught up in pornography know this. They say, wow, I never did that, but they're doing it on this show or this video, whatever they're watching, um, and maybe I should try that. Maybe I have permission that the world sets before them all kinds of defilements that they can say, yeah, maybe I could try that. And when they've turned away from Christ, they reject those entanglements. But then, when they sin, they get entangled in them again. And they reject Christ. And they'll say, look, Christianity is too much of a killjoy. You have a lot more fun in the world. And so we're going to leave Christianity because you don't want this. And they have free will to make that choice. That's, again, the assumption here in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 and 21, that you have free will and that you can turn back from the holy commandments, to quote uh, Peter, uh, that, that you can turn back from those holy commandments and choose to commit sin. That is a choice that each one of us makes. And this is very basic for us to understand because what we'll take a look at next is something that is also rejected as an idea by people who believe once you're saved, you're always saved. Namely, this is the teaching about mortal sin. <coughs> we need to understand, is mortal sin something that the Bible teaches? Because if so, then you might have the possibility of making, doing acts that take you completely away from God's grace and put an end to the life of the soul. So please stay with us and we'll continue on with that topic.
right, now we have uh, been looking at the problems of irresistible grace because scripture, we have found three passages there where it says you can resist the grace and turn against it and that once you're saved, you're always saved. It, it's just not quite there. Now we're going to go to the issue of mortal sin, which is also a problem. So let's take a look at a possibility, uh, th this idea, by looking first at St. Paul. Because St. Paul teaches that there are some sins that if you commit them, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven that some sins are so serious. And again, remember that as I go through this list, he is writing this not to Gentiles, not to people outside the faith. He is writing this to other Christians, people who are already baptized and coming to the Eucharist every week and so on. So this is a... This is a list that he writes to those already committed and it's more it's three different lists let's take a look at the first one in first corinthians chapter 6 beginning with verse 9 where he writes do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither the immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers nor sexual perverts nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, these are all sins. Why are drunkards in that? This is something we have to consider as, you know, going back to um, what I had said, uh, quoting Karl Marx, where he says that religion is the opiate of the people. And now what we see is that there are a lot of our politicians who are saying, no, opiates will be the opiate of the people. We're going to legalize marijuana, even though it's against federal law. They, <laughs> they're legalizing it and, and running into a lot of problems where it is legal, a variety of kinds of problems. And so here, what we want to do is take a look at uh, you know, that as a sin. Why is it such a serious sin? Because when you get drunk, whether it's on alcohol or meth or heroin, it, yeah, it's, it's not the same as alcohol, but you're still giving control of your free will over to a substance. That's why that is so sinful. And that's just one example. That, uh, and, if, and if you give control of your free will over to um, a uh, substance, how can you go to heaven? You won't be able to choose it. And, you know, uh, robbers, now we're, we're seeing that in some, uh, what is it, the district attorney in San Francisco is now saying, no, only if you steal $950 or more will we prosecute you. And so crime goes up, but it's still wrong. Even if you're poor, you don't have the right to steal other people's property. You don't. And breaking into people's homes, etc. You have no right. And if you make yourself into that kind of a thief, you, uh, we're stealing uh, in a way that harms people seriously. Uh, and, and their finances and such. You can't go to heaven. Now here's another list where he talks about the same issue, and that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, where he says, Now the works of the flesh are plain, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, 
drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Really clear. And, you, you, you know, again, in our society, fornication is just taken as kind of the norm, that you move in together before marriage and you just treat that as the norm. Well, uh, fornication refers to sexual relations outside of the bond of marriage. Of course, adultery is with somebody who is married. Right? One, at least one of the partners is married, and that's breaking that bond. That's false. And you can take a look, and you see sorcery and idolatry, worshiping other gods. This becomes popular. Some people think, we're going to go back to our roots. We're going to worship uh, ancient gods or other people. I'm going to practice various kinds of uh, magic or uh, the occult. They like to call it the occult and magic instead of uh, sorcery. Uh, some do it sorcery. Uh, think of the popularity of the um, Harry Potter series with people and you know how much that's entertainment. But these things where you try to control the spiritual through sorcery, that can exclude you from the kingdom of God. And then a uh, third passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, where it says, Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure per man or one who is covetous, that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Again, these are sins that can exclude you from heaven. So, as I mentioned, in all three passages, St. Paul is addressing Christians, not outsiders, and warning them that they could go back to these sins. Now, that's very serious because implied in this, in that three times St. Paul warns Christians that if they do these things, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, he assumes that they who have made an act of faith can contradict it by doing these serious sins. And that's why it's worth it for us to examine our conscience and confess often. So that's one thing. But then there's another teaching that you know, explicitly brings up the issue of mortal sin. Mortal sin is mentioned in Scripture. A lot of the Calvinists reject this idea. But the scripture is clear and explicit. And uh, this is in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. I do not say that one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not mortal. But then, of course, if there's sin that is not mortal, he's, and he says there, there is sin that is mortal too. Both of them exist. And this is something that we mean. Now, what do we mean by mortal sin? Mortal sin is a sin that cuts off the life of grace in a soul. It put, that's why it's mortal. It puts to death the life of grace. And a lot of the translations correctly say a sin that leads to death. Now, St. Paul, or excuse me, St. John did not have the word venial. Because he was raised up speaking Aramaic and he was writing in Greek. Uh, there's no knowledge that he knew much Latin. Probably like everybody knew a couple words. It was the official language of government in those days. But, um, you know, he doesn't seem to have known it. And so the word venial was not in his vocabulary. So he just says, it's not mortal. But 
later on in church history, they came up with the term, term venial sin. Now, this comes from a Latin word, venia. Venia refers to indulgence, mercy, pardon, favor, forgiveness. And therefore, a venial sin is one that is easily forgiven because it's not as serious a matter as other sins. So, and remember, I'm not recommending any sin. All, all wrongdoing is sin. We shouldn't do any sin. But I am, would explain, I am explaining this. If you steal a pack of gum from a store, that is not as serious as taking five bucks from a guy who's on the, living on the street. You know, we have a lot of people who are living on the streets, especially in some parts of the country, where you know high drug use. It's mostly related to high drug use and mental disorders, as well as the impossibility of getting housing. It's hard for them to find housing because it's expense especially if they're on drugs. The drugs ruin a lot of people's lives, and sometimes they're on drugs because they have mental problems. But given that, uh, if you steal 10 bucks from them, that can affect whether they have a meal that day. And that's a serious, serious sin. I remember uh, not long ago, there was some guy who just, you know, homeless and uh, one of the uh, gangs, you know, just brutally murdered him. You know, that just added, because of his helplessness, added that this is even worse. And stealing from such people is worse than stealing from a store. Now, stealing from a store is wrong, but it doesn't put them out of business. It doesn't take away a meal for all the employees, but it does that for it. So you have to evaluate some the seriousness of different sins. And there are different kinds of sins. Um, and with venial sins, uh, they don't put the life of grace to the soul, whereas deadly or mortal sins are contrary to charity. They're against that kind of love that we have for God and everybody else. And that charity is the root of all the other infused virtues. So if you put to death charity, then the other virtues will also be lost. And that's why it's called deadly. And uh, St. Thomas likes to use that word mortal um, as a metaphor for the death of the life of grace in the soul. And using scripture here. So, if, um, as, as Thomas says, uh, charity is banished by one act of mortal sin, therefore all the infused virtues are expelled, then faith, hope, and charity are no longer the present. That's, that's the problem that happens. And venial sin doesn't contradict charity, and it doesn't expel the other virtues. It has less, so, usually it's the smallest things that we do on a daily basis. Now, ought we to keep working against those venial sins? Absolutely. Do they harm our Christian life? Yes. Do they drive the people around you crazy? Probably. And a lot of them will let you know if you're committing them. <laughs> Ask your spouse if you're not sure that you're committing sin. <laughs> they'll, they'll help you figure that out. Now, um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind that the Catholic Church does accept, obviously, the biblical teaching from 1 John chapter 5, that all sin is wrongdoing. This is it's all incorrect. But it also accepts St. John's distinction between sins that are mortal and those that are not. We just give them Non, instead of using non-mortal, we have a word, a term, venial. 
that uh, to describe it. That's the only difference. It's just, but that's a terminological difference. And we believe that mortal sin destroys the life of charity in the soul, and thereby destroys faith and hope in the soul. And that's very important. And again, this is something that Saint John was writing to Christians. He wasn't writing this to those outside the faith, but he wrote 1 John to the Christians of Ephesus, where he had been living for a good 20 years. And um, it's Saint Paul, warn excuse me, Saint John warning the Christians of Ephesus the way Saint Paul had warned the Christians of Ephesus at an earlier time, in about 30 years earlier, in the 60s, and had warned the Corinthians and the Galatians that you can lose salvation by committing a serious sin, that this is possible. And therefore, we need to be very alert that we don't you know, commit these mortal sins. That's why Jesus, our Lord, said, once you're saved, you're always saved. No, he never said that. He never said that. What he said was, be watchful, stay alert. That is what all of us have to do. And this is a very important doctrine. All right, now we're getting ready to move to the last part of TULIP namely the issue of perseverance. And the Bible teaches us to persevere. Okay? So uh, this is something that um, we very much want to do. We are summoned to be faithful to Jesus, to his teaching, and to his church. Even when there are Judas Iscariots inside the church, even, remember, Judas Iscariot had been ordained a bishop and was, had received his first Holy Communion just a couple hours before betraying Jesus with a kiss for 30 pieces of silver. So, this is, so even though we have Judases in the church, even though there are weak, the, the other 11 were not that much better, 11 uh, uh, ran away in the face of danger, and the Pope, Peter, denied even knowing Jesus. This happens. This happens. But that doesn't mean that we leave Christ in his church. We don't become uh, self-centered. We don't commit sin. And we will be held accountable for that. So this is something that is extremely important to understand. It's time to take a break. We'll do that. We'll come back in just a couple minutes, so please stay with us. Um, I know I, I want to get to your questions, but let me just finish what I began here and, uh, and talk a little bit about um, the, this issue of perseverance. I'll just do this from the perspective of the Old Testament, right? we'll, and then next week we'll do New Testament passages. That we, the, the scripture, the church, the tradition, all tell us to persevere with Christ. This notion that we have free will and have a choice to persevere or to fall away goes back to the Old Testament. One of the best passages, there are two passages I want to take a look at. First is in Ezekiel chapter 3. 
verse 17. Let's take a look at that. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, in order to save his life, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Again, if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. But because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin. And his righteous deeds, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. This brings out two aspects of perseverance. The wicked person can turn away from their wickedness. But also the righteous person can turn away from righteousness. And in this passage, we see that Ezekiel says, uh, Ezekiel is being told by the Lord. The Lord God is speaking to Ezekiel saying, if you don't warn them against sinning, I'll hold you responsible. They're responsible for what they did wrong. But you're responsible for not speaking up. And this is where we all in our culture have to deal with this nonsense. Oh, don't be so judgmental. Uh, people will say that when they know they're wrong. And they'll say, don't judge me. Um, no, I'm not judging you. I can't. But your behavior is sinful. And if I don't warn you, I'm answerable to God. We have to speak these things up. And so the prophet who's supposed to speak up is culpable, and the person who is changing from wickedness to righteousness or from righteousness back to wickedness is responsible. And we all have this mutual responsibility. The same message is also found in Ezekiel 18, verse 30 and 32, where Ezekiel wrote, Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Thus says the Lord, repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God, so turn and live. This also speaks about the necessity of converting to God away from sin and doing that which is necessary and good. Now, next week, we are going to continue with this theme of perseverance as Jesus taught about it. But let's now take a look at some of the questions that we have from you. Okay. First one is from Anonymous. I understand why. It says, Father Mitch, if one has falsely accused you of doing something that you did not do, and it has ruined your reputation, especially in your parish, how does one persevere when you tried all you can that is based in Scripture and tradition? Anonymous. Anonymous, this is a dreadfully painful situation. And it happens to too many people. I don't know why people would try to ruin another's reputation, a variety of motives, but they do. And especially in, I, I think a big part of it is our culture has entered into an ideology of justice is absolutely necessary, which it is. Justice is necessary, and people should act justly towards me. That's for sure. And toward each other, toward everybody. But 
justice when it is by itself becomes harsh and demanding and it needs to have the role of mercy with it. God has absolute justice and absolute mercy. And one of our goals is to find that. And what you're not seeing in some of these other folks is the presence of the mercy, only the justice. Here's what you can do. And, and this is something that um, various people have had to put up with. And I've had to deal with some of this at different times too. It's not important in what way, but it was um, uh, things that uh, been said that got, you know, about my teaching on the New Age movement, for instance. You know. um, what you do is you persevere by looking for other places where they don't ruin your reputation. You know, I've been banned uh, I w back in the 90s, I was banned from a num number of places because of my criticisms of the Enneagram and the New Age movement. Okay, I, I can say that much. Uh, and a lot of places wouldn't let me, a lot of bishops wouldn't let me in their diocese. Uh, I was criticizing what was going on in uh, their retreat houses. And so they wouldn't let me in. I went to other places. I found other dioceses where they did allow me. I found other situations where I can serve Christ. And I let, I let it go. There was nothing I could do about it. And eventually, I was exonerated. As a matter of fact, what I wrote against the Enneagram was picked up by the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and published in an official church document against the New Age movement, Christ the Bear of the Water of Life. And I, was, uh, I wrote part of it and was a consultant for other parts. So that what I taught was eventually exonerated. If you are innocent, simply go to another place where you can be exonerated and you know, uh, uh, where you can do your service of Christ. Even if it means you have to go to a very low key, quiet kind of place. I've had other friends who've had to do that, but they found ways to more quietly minister until the day of their exoneration. And if the exoneration does not happen among these human beings, I guarantee you that it will happen with God. But until then, you persevere and you keep serving him and see what happens later on. I can't tell you how it will happen because I'm not in charge. But I trust in our Lord and this is something that we all have to deal with. Well, I have another email here. This is from Benjamin, where he says, I am regularly having discussions with an evangelical pastor, and we seem to find our main disagreement to be defending apostolic succession. He disagreed with me that Matthias replacing Judas is an example of the apostles promoting bishops since Matthias had specific qualifications followed with Jesus. Uh, he followed uh, with Jesus since the beginning, for example. Is there anywhere else I can look in sacred scripture to help explain apostolic succession? Benjamin. Well, there are certain, there are three epistles that are called the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus, one and two Timothy and Titus, where St. Paul instructs his disciples, Timothy, whom he left as the bishop of Ephesus, and Titus, whom he left as the bishop of uh, Crete. And he told them to ordain other men as bishops, and he gave qualifications for ordaining. So you see it there. Then you also go to when St. Paul went to Ephesus, and after working there for three and a half years, he also left 
bishops and priests. So he did that. And, you know, I, you can't, you know, I, I can't help that he doesn't like that. You know, this, this evangelical friend of yours, but it's very clearly there and that the church continues that ever since. All right, and then let's go over to an email from Marilyn. If we are judged when we die by God, how can our prayers help the departed souls? And if we are in purgatory, only God knows how long we should be there. How can our prayers help those souls? Thank you, Marilyn. Well, Marilyn, God's judgment is for uh, some people to be in purgatory. And those are the souls we seek to help. Our prayers cannot help the souls in hell. They're there. And they don't need to help the souls in heaven. They're there. They already made it. But the souls in purgatory, by God's grace, is something that our prayers can help. So that's why in 2 Maccabees 15, we see that it is a good and righteous thing to pray for the just. And then also in 1 Peter 3, we see that our Lord went and preached to the souls in the prison and allowed them to come to heaven. So this is something that is, um, you know, uh, very important for uh, us to keep in mind. God, by his grace, makes us able to pray for people just as he uses us priests to confect the Eucharist. And he uses us priests to preach the word. He could have an angel come and do it, but he uses us. He uses you and me to pray for those souls. And finally, let me just get one last one from Don. This is an easy one. Father Mitch, I recently went on a cruise and wasn't able to find a Sunday Mass. I knew this before I went. Am I guilty of serious sin for not going to Mass on Sunday? He made this choice to uh, go where I couldn't find a mass. Well, here's, here's the thing. You know, um, it's, uh, I, w I always, you know, make it much more careful about where I go on vacation. Um, I, I'm a priest. I can find a place to celebrate mass. And that, that's a bit easier. But, um, you know, it is important to try to find a place where you can worship God while you're on that trip. And yet, if you were choosing it because you couldn't get to Mass, that would be a serious sin. If you were choosing this because you wanted this trip, and then that was a side effect, that's what we call the principle of double effect. You didn't intend that, but that's what happened. So uh, then you can't get there, you can't get there. And I can't go on, run out of time. The Lord bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>